ahead in due time through the growth of understanding, by the intuitive diagnosis of disease, and by the magnificent work of scientific and academic medicine, plus a truer comprehension of right living conditions. I prefer rather to give still wider generalizations which will indicate causes and will not emphasize the consequences of these causes. and of contamination. For untold eons, the bodies of men and of animals have been laid away in the ground. That soil is consequently impregnated with the germs and the results of disease and this in a far subtler form than is surmised. The germs of ancient known and unknown diseases are to be found in the layers of the soil and the subsoil. These can still produce virus if presented with proper conditions. Let me state that nature never intended that bodies would be buried in the ground. The animals die and their bodies return to the dust, but return purified by the rays of the sun and by the breezes which blow and disperse. The sun can cause death as well as life, and the most virulent germs and bacteria cannot retain their potency of submitted to the dry heat of the sun's rays. Moisture and darkness foster disease as it emanates from and is nourished by bodies from whence the life aspect has been drawn. When, in all countries throughout the world, the rule is to submit dead forms to the ordeal by fire, and when this has become a universal and persistent habit, we shall then see a great diminution of disease in a much healthier world. 2. The psychological condition of a race or of a nation, as we have seen, produces a tendency to disease and to a lowered resistance to the causes of disease, it can engender an ability to absorb evil contamination with facility. On this I need not further enlarge. 3. Living conditions in many lands also foster disease and ill health. Dark and crowded tenements, underground homes, undernourishment, wrong food, evil habits of life and various occupational diseases, all contribute their quota to the general ill health of humanity. These conditions are universally recognized and much has been done to offset them, but much remains to be done. One of the good effects of the World War will be to force the needed changes, the required rebuilding, and the scientific nourishment of the youth of the race. National physical ills vary according to the predisposing occupations of the people. The diseases of an agricultural race will differ widely from those of a highly industrialized race. The physical predispositions of a sailor vary greatly from those of an office worker in one of our large cities. These items of information are again with the platitudes of the social worker in the many cities and lands. Certain diseases appear to be purely local, others seem universal in their effects, certain diseases are. Copyright Copyright 1998 Lucis Trust 150 A Treatise on the Seven Rays, Volume 4, Esoteric Healing Gradually dying out, and new diseases are appearing, certain forms of disease are forever with us, others seem to be sickled in their appearance, some diseases are endemic whilst others are epidemic. How can this vast array of disease and forms of bodily ills come to be? How is it that some races are prone to succumb to one form of physical ill whilst other races are resistant to it? Climatic conditions produce certain typical diseases which remain strictly local and are not found elsewhere in the world. Cancer, tuberculosis,
diseases of that civilization. If a full review of the health of the world were to be undertaken and presented to the thinking public, taken in normal conditions and not in war time, the question arises whether there are 100,000 perfectly healthy people to be found out of the billions now inhabiting the earth. I think not. If no actual and active disease is present, nevertheless the condition of the teeth, the hearing and the sight leave frequently much to be desired. Inherited tendencies and active predispositions cause great concern, and to all this must be added psychological difficulty, mental diseases and definite brain trouble. All this presents an appalling picture. Against the ills which it discloses, medicine is today battling. Scientists are searching for alleviations and cures and for sound and lasting methods of eradication. Research students are investigating the latent germs, and health experts are seeking new ways to meet the onslaught of disease. Sanitation, compulsory inoculation, frequent inspection, pure food laws, Legal requirements and better housing conditions are all brought into this battle by the far-seeing humanitarian. Yet still disease is rampant, more hospitals are required and the death rate soars. To these practical agencies, mental science, new thought, unity and Christian science offer their aid, and seek quite honestly to bring the power of the mind to bear upon the problem. At the present stage, these agencies and groups largely are in the hands of fanatics and devoted, unintelligent people. They refuse all compromise and seem unable to recognize that the knowledge accumulated by medicine and by those who work scientifically with the human body is as God-given as their, as yet, improved ideal. Later, the truths for which these books stand will be added to the work of the psychologist and the physician. When this has been done, we shall see a great improvement. When the work of the doctor and the surgeon in relation to the physical body is recognized as essential and good, when the analysis and conclusions of the psychologist supplement their work, and when the power of right thought comes likewise as an aid, then and only then, shall we enter upon a new era of well-being. Copyright Copyright 1998 Lucis Trust 151 A Treatise on the Seven Rays Volume 4 Esoteric Healing to the various categories of trouble must also be added a whole group of diseases which are more strictly mental in their effect, the cleavages, the insanities, the obsessions, the mental breaks, the aberrations and the hallucinations. To the various healing agencies mentioned above should be added the work undertaken by members of the spiritual hierarchy and their disciples. It takes soul power and knowledge, plus the wisdom of the other healing groups, to produce health among people, to empty our sanitariums, to rid humanity of the basic diseases, of lunacy and obsession, and to prevent crime. This is finally brought about by the right integration of the whole man, through a right comprehension of the nature of energy, and through a correct appreciation of the endocrine system, its glands and their subtle relationships. At present there is little coherent and integrated work done in unison by the four groups. 1. Physicians and Surgeons, Orthodox and Academic. 2. Psychologists, Neurologists and Psychiatrists. 3. Mental 
and arrive at an understanding of the true wonder of the human being. We shall someday have hospitals in which the four phases of this one medical and remedial work will proceed side by side and in the fullest cooperation. Neither group can do a complete task without the others, all are interdependent. It is the inability of these groups to recognize the good in the other groups striving for the physical well-being of humanity which makes it almost impossible for me to do more specific teaching and more direct talking on these matters. Have you any idea of the wall of antagonistic thinking and speech against which a new or pioneering idea has to batter itself? Have you ever seriously considered the aggregated and crystallized thought forms with which all such new ideas, and shall I call them hierarchical proposals, have to contend? Do you appreciate the dead weight of preconceived and ancient determinations which have to be moved before the hierarchy can cause a new and needed concept to penetrate into the consciousness of the average thinking, or again should I say, unthinking? Public. The field of medicine is a most difficult field in which to work, for the subject is so intimate, and fear enters so strongly into the reactions of those who must be reached. The gulf between the old and established and the new and the spiritually demanded, needs much long and careful bridging. A great deal of the difficulty is, curiously enough, to be found fostered by the newer schools of thought. Orthodox medicine is slow, and rightly slow, in adopting new techniques and methods. It is at times too slow, but the case of the new mode of treatment or diagnosis must be rightly proven and statistically proven before it can be incorporated in the medical curriculum and method. The risks to the human subject are too great, and the good humanitarian physician will not make his patient the subject. Copyright Copyright 1998 Lucis Trust 152 a Treatise on the Seven Rays, Volume 4, Esoteric Healing of Experimentation. However, within the last few decades, medicine has advanced by leaps and bounds. The science of electricity and light therapy and many other modern techniques and methods have already been added to the various other sciences of which medicine avails itself. Demands of the intangible and the treatment of the nebulous, if such peculiar terms are in order, are being recognized increasingly and are known to play an orthodox and recognized part in the newer approaches to disease. The approach of the mental schools and cults, as they erroneously call themselves, has not proceeded so helpfully. This is largely their fault. Mental science, new thought, unity, Christian science, chiropractic enterprise, the efforts of the naturopaths and many others, hurt their cause, only to the large claims which they make into their unceasing attacks upon orthodox medicine and other channels of proven helpfulness and upon the knowledge acquired over centuries of experimentation of the academic skills of medicine and surgery. They forget that many of their claims to success, and they are often irrefutable, can be classed under the general heading of faith cures, and this can be done correctly or incorrectly. Such cures have long been recognized by the academic thinker and known to be factual. These cults which are in fact the custodians of needed truths, need above everything else to change their approach 
even gross stupidity, greatly ameliorate the pains and ills of the masses of men. These cults omit to state, or even to recognize, that in cases of extreme illness or accident, the patient is physically unable to affirm or claim divine healing and is dependent upon the work of some healer who works with no knowledge of the karma of the patient. Many of their so-called cures, and this is the case also with orthodox medicine, are cures because the hour of the end has not yet arrived for the patient and he would have recovered in any case, though he often does so more rapidly, owing to the remedial measures of the trained physician. In cases of serious accident, where the injured person will bleed, the cultist, no matter what his code may be called, will perforce avail himself of the methods of the orthodox physician. He will apply a tourniquet, for instance, and take the measures which orthodox medicine enjoins, rather than stand by and see the injured person die because these methods are not used. When he is face to face with death, he will frequently turn to the tried and proved methods of health and will usually call in a physician rather than be charged with murder. All the above is said in no spirit of disparagement, but in an effort to prove that the many schools of God, Orthodox, Academic, Ancient, Material or Spiritual, New, Pioneering or Mental, interdependent, they need to be brought together into one great healing science. This will be a copyright copyright 1998 loses trust. 153. A treatise on the seven rays. Volume 4. Esoteric healing. Science which will heal the whole man and bring into play all the resources, physical, emotional, mental and spiritual, of which humanity is capable. Orthodox medicine is more open to cooperation with the newer cults than are the neophytes of the science of mental control of disease. They cannot, however, permit their patients to be turned into guinea pigs is not that the term used in these cases, brother of mine. For the satisfaction of the pioneering cultist and the proving of his theories, no matter how correct when applied in conjunction with what has already been proved. The middle way of compromise and of mutual cooperation is ever the wisest, and this is a lesson much needed today in every department of human thinking. We shall now proceed to deal with our third and final section of thoughts around the basic causes of disease. The theme of karma has been little considered and I shall deal with it in a way larger than our particular subject perhaps warrants. Chapter 3, Our Karmic Liabilities Introductory Remarks We have reached now the concluding phase of our approach to the problem of disease. In our next part we shall deal with the attitudes and temperaments of the patient, taking into consideration his ray and also the state of mind of the healer. All these points are of prime importance when one comes to the consideration of the fine art of healing. It is, however, essential that ill health, acute disease, and death itself should find their place in the overall picture. A particular incarnation is not an isolated event in the life of the soul, but is a part and an aspect of a sequence of experiences which are intended to lead to one clear, definite goal, the goal of free choice and a deliberate return out of matter to spirit and eventual liberation. There has been much talk among esotericists particularly in the Eastern presentation of the path to reality and end liberation. The goal held before the unified is liberation, freedom, emancipation, this, by and large, is the keynote of life itself. The concept is a transferring out of the realm of the purely selfish and of personal liberation into something much wider and more important. This concept of liberation lies behind the modern use of the word, liberty, but is far wiser, better and deeper in its connotation. Liberty, in the minds of many, is freedom from the imposition of any man's will. 
sacrifice of the unit, consciously and deliberately offered for the service of the whole. There had been other world saviors, but the issues involved had not so clearly been expressed, because the mind of man had not been ready to grasp the implications. Service is the keynote of liberation. Christ was the ideal server. 2. The signing of the Magna Charta. This document was signed at Runnymede during the reign of King John on June 15, 1215 AD. Here the idea of liberation from authority was presented with the emphasis upon the personal liberty and rights of the individual. The growth and development of this basic idea, mental concept and formulated perception falls into four phases or chapters. A. The signing of the Magna Charta, emphasizing personal liberty. B. The founding of the French Republic with its emphasis upon human liberty. Circa. The Declaration of Independence and the Bill of Rights, determining national policy. D. The Atlantic Charter and the Four Freedoms, bringing the whole question into the international field, and guaranteeing to men and women everywhere in the world liberty and freedom to develop the divine reality within themselves. The ideal has gradually become clarified so that today the mass of men everywhere know what are the basic essentials of happiness. 3. The Emancipation of the Slaves The spiritual idea of human liberty, which had become a recognized ideal, became a demanding desire, and a great symbolic happening took place when the slaves were freed. Like all things which human beings enact, perfection is non-existent. The Negro is not free in this land of the free, and America will have to clean house in this respect. To put it in clear, concise words, the USA must see to it that the Constitution and the Bill of Rights are facts and not a dream. Only thus can the inevitable working of the law of karma, which is our theme today, be offset. The Negroes are Americans, as well as the New Englanders and all other stocks which are not indigenous in this country, and the Constitution is theirs also. As yet, copyright copyright 1998 loses trust. 155. A Treatise on the Seven Rays, Volume 4, Esoteric Healing. The privileges it confers are withheld by those who are the slaves of selfishness and fear. 4. The liberation of humanity by the United Nations. We are participating in a great spectacular and symbolic happening and are watching it in process. The liberation of the individual has moved onward through the symbolic liberation of a section of humanity races, the Lemurian and the Atlantean, to the liberation of millions of human beings, enslaved by the forces of evil, by millions of their fellow men. The ideal has worked through into a practical worldwide effort upon the physical plane and has demanded worldwide sacrifice. It has involved the entire three worlds of human evolution, and for this reason the Christ can now lead his forces and aid human beings to liberate mankind. What has really been happening, therefore, in the lives of individuals, in the lives of nations and in the life of humanity? A tremendous move to put right most ancient evil, to offset conscious
ideals prove the fact of some initiating world of causes. Historical conditions, the relationships between nations, social taboos, religious convictions and tendencies can all be traced to originating causes, some of them most ancient. Everything that is happening in the world today and which is so potently affecting humanity, things of beauty and of horror, modes of living and civilization and culture, prejudices and likings, scientific attainment and artistic expression and the many ways in which humanity throughout the planet colors existence, are aspects of effects, initiated somewhere, on some level at some time, by human beings, both individually and en masse. Karma is therefore that which man, the heavenly man in whom we live, humanity as a whole, mankind in groups as nations, and individual man, has instituted, carried forward, endorsed, omitted to do or has done right through the ages until the present moment. Today, the harvest is ripe and mankind is reaping what it has sown, preparatory to a fresh plowing in the springtime of the new age, with a fresh sowing of the seed which will let us pray and hope produce a better harvest. The outstanding evidence of the law of cause and effect is the Jewish race. All nations prove this law, but I choose to refer to the Hebrew peoples because their history is so well known and their future and their destiny are subjects of worldwide, universal concern. The Jews have copyright copyright 1998 Lucas Trust 156 The Treatise on the Seven Rays Symbolic role in that it is humanity which is the 
chosen people and not one small and unimportant fraction of the race.
that has happened to the Jews originated in their past history and in their pronounced attitude of separativeness and non-assimilability, and in their emphasis upon material good, yet the agents who have brought the evil karma upon them equally incur the retributive aspect of the same law. The situation has now assumed the form of a vicious circle of error and wrongdoing, of retribution and revenge, and in view of this the time must come when together the nations will confer upon this problem, and together they will cooperate to bring to an end the wrong attitudes on both sides. All karma of evil nature is solved by the presentation of an accepting will, a cooperative love, a frank acknowledgement of responsibility and a skillful adjustment of united joint activity to bring about the good of humanity as a whole, and not just the good of an individual nation or people or race. The Jewish problem will not be solved by taking possession of Palestine, by claim and demand and by financial manipulations. That would be but the prolongation of ancient wrong and material possessiveness. The problem will be solved by the willingness of the Jew to conform to the civilization, the cultural background and the standards of living of the nation to which, by Copyright Copyright 1998 Lucis Trust 158 The Treatise on the Seven Rays Volume 4 Esoteric Healing The Fact of Birth and Education He is related and with which he should assimilate It will come by the relinquishment of pride of race and of the concept of selectivity it will come by renouncing dogmas and customs which are intrinsically obsolete and which create points of constant irritation to the matrix within which the Jew finds himself. It will come when selfishness in business relations and the pronounced manipulative tendencies of the Hebrew people are exchanged for more selfless and honest forms of activity. The Jew, owing to his race and point of development, is outstanding creative and artistic. This he must recognize and not seek as he now is to dominate in all fields, to grasp all opportunities away from other people, and so better himself and his own people at the expense of others. Release from the present situation will come when the Jew forgets that he is a Jew and becomes in his inmost consciousness an Italian, an American, a Britisher, a German or a Pole. This is not so at this time. The Jewish problem will be solved by intermarriage, that of the Negro will not. This will mean concession and compromise on the part of the Orthodox Jews, not the concession of expediency but the concession of conviction. Let me point out also that just as the Kabbalah and the Talmud are secondary lines of esoteric approach to truth, and materialistic in their technique embodying much of the magical work of relating one grade of matter to the substance of another grade, so the Old Testament is emphatically a secondary scripture, and spiritually does not rank with the Bhagavad Gita, the ancient scriptures of the East and the New Testament. Its emphasis is material and its effect is to impress a purely materialistic Jehovah upon world consciousness. The general theme of the Old Testament is the recovery of the highest expression of the divine wisdom in the first solar system, that system embodied the creative work of the third aspect of divinity, that of active intelligence, expressing itself through matter. intended to be the expression of the second aspect, of the love of God. This the Jew has never grasped, for the love expressed in the Old Testament is the separative, possessive love of Jehovah for a distinct unit within the fourth or human kingdom. Street, Paul summed up the attitude which humanity should assume in the words, there is neither Jew nor Gentile. intended to end his isolation, to bring him to the point of relinquishing material goals, of renouncing a nationality that has a tendency to be somewhat 
to you that it is entirely needless for me to 
1998 Uses Trust. 160. The Treatise on the Seven Rays, Volume 4, Esoteric Healing. Essential that those of you who are interested in the study of disease and its healing should admit this and permit it to form the basis of your approach. I have indicated that medicine and medical treatments of the future will start with this fact as their prime determination. The factual nature of medical discovery is not disowned by me. I seek to carry the matter forward from that point, and it is no part of my program to ignore the wise discoveries of modern medical science, nor am I on the side of those groups of people who run down and refuse to admit the findings of modern medicine, this I have earlier emphasized. I want to indicate the trend of future medical research, which will be to seek for the seed of the trouble in the realm of vitality, as it may be called by orthodox investigators, and which we would regard as in the realm of the etheric body. Let me here make a practical statement which might be regarded as the next rule in this treatise. Rule 6 diagnosis of the disease, based on the ascertained outer symptoms, will be simplified to this extent that, once the organ involved is known and thus isolated, the center in the etheric body which is in closest relation to it will be subjected to methods of occult healing. Guidance and protection of the masses 
and their spiritual natures and in the guidance and protection of their physical vehicles, doctors and priests can be divided into various groups, some adhering to old group techniques, some so fundamentalist in position that they refuse to investigate that which is new and unproven, and some so idealistic, speculative and fanatical that they rush ahead and enter into a world of speculative experiment which may or may not give them the key to the medicine of the future but which certainly puts their patients into the category of what you call guinea pigs. The surest and least speculative field in medical practice is that which is concerned with the surgical relief of the patient. It is founded on a sure knowledge of anatomy. Its diagnosis of requirements can be intelligently controlled, and its practice when in the hands of a sound and reputable surgeon can and frequently does produce a cure or a real prolongation of life. However, even in that field little is known about the results of an operation as it may affect the etheric body and consequently, the nervous system through the intermediate system of the nadis, or the etheric counterpart of the nerves. I would instance the removal of some organ. Definite results must necessarily be present in a period of difficult adjustment must inevitably take place within the subtle mechanism of the patient. The area of the body which has received surgical treatment, and particularly the center in closest relation to it, must be affected, for the circulatory flow of energy, emanating from the center, will find itself, short-circuited, if I could use such a phrase. This flow, which has hitherto passed through the area of surgical attention, must work its way to all parts of the body, via the, not these, these, as you know, underlie and feed the needed energy to the nervous system. Old channels for the flow of energy will have been removed, as the result of operative measures, major or minor. New channels are lines of force, bridging the, mutilated, area, will have to be established and a basic adjustment will have to be made within the vital mechanism of the patient. Along this line there is practically nothing is yet known. It is not even yet in the field of advanced research. The new medicine cannot be scientifically formulated or intelligently presented until such time as the fact of the etheric body is accepted in its existence, as a mechanism of energy supply and as the vital aspect of the outer form, is generally recognized. The shift of the attention of the medical profession will then be away from the outer, tangible, physical effects into the inner causes, as they are to be found in the centers and their related fields of activity. Within the areas where a disease is manifested, certain esoteric facts and the general subject have already been posited by me. 1. That disease, in its immediate cause, can be traced to the individual etheric body when the difficulty is purely local, or to the planetary etheric body, in particular the etheric body of the fourth kingdom in nature, where epidemics are involved, or to such a condition as war, affecting large masses of men. Copyright Copyright 1998 Lucis Trust 162. A Treatise on the Seven Rays, Volume 4, Esoteric Healing. 2. That the etheric body has not hitherto been considered as an existent fact, from the angle of orthodox medicine, though there is a modern drift towards emphasis upon vitality, upon the vital qualities in food, and the giving of vitamin products in order to build up a vital response. This is the first indication of an unrealized need to increase the potency of the vital body. 3. That the condition of the etheric body predisposes the subject to disease or protects it from disease, making man resistant to the impact of BT 
deteriorating or epidemic factors, are failing to do so because of inherent etheric weakness. Oh, 
methods of healing, particularly as clairvoyant vision is developed and becomes recognized by science, and known to be an extension of a normal sense. 10. As the true astrology comes into its own and is developed into a reputable science, the charts of the soul and of the personality can be related to each other. Then the etheric body will be checked by correct astrological conclusions, and the physician will be on far surer ground than he now is. The astrology of the past concerned the life of the personality, the astrology of the future will indicate the purpose of the soul, and will completely revolutionize medicine among other things. It must, however, lifted out of the hands of those interested in predictional astrology, out of the hands of the thousands who at this time spend much time, casting, horoscopes seeking to interpret their usually erroneous conclusions, and placed in the hands of trained mathematical scientists and in the hands of those who have given as much time to scientific training along astrological lines as is now given to training a reputable physician, a chemist or a biologist. 11. These astrological findings will not only be related to the personality and the soul charts, but will also enter the field of medicine, particularly in relation to the etheric body. Today, any astrological investigation done in the field of medicine has relation to physical disease within the Copyright Copyright 1998 Lucis Trust 164 A Treatise on the Seven Rays Volume 4 Esoteric Healing Physical Body In the future, it will concentrate upon the condition of the etheric this is a new and imminent development in astrological research. Another difficulty which I have to face, as I seek to present to you the medicine of the future, is that I think in terms of cycles and you think in terms of a few brief years. What I am in reality attempting to do is to indicate the lines along which medical research will trend during the next 200 years. The effort of the present day approach is how to cure a person here and now. This is a natural reaction, and advanced thinkers seem to be able to do this at this time through the medium of so-called esoteric and mental modes of healing. Yet little is known of the makeup of the vital body and practically no background of research in this field exists. Modern medicine is of very ancient origin. Over the centuries it has grown and developed until modern skill, modern research, modern techniques and modern methods of healing and of cure are amazingly successful. This is oft forgotten in the emphasis laid by the adherent. Adherents of new and untried schools upon the failures to cure, which they attribute to wrong methods and fail to allow for karmic limitations. The success of modern medicine is today so great that millions of people are kept alive, if not cured, who in earlier days and with less scientific aptitude would normally have died. In this developed skill and knowledge, and in this aptitude in the care of the physical mechanism, is today to be found a major world problem, the problem of the overpopulation of the planet, leading to the herd life of humanity and the consequent economic problem, to mention only one of the incidental difficulties of this success. This, unnatural, preservation of life is the cause of much suffering and is a fruitful source of war, being contrary to the karmic intent of the planetary logos. With this vast problem, I cannot here deal. I can only indicate it. It will be solved when the fear of death disappears and when humanity learns the significance of time and the meaning of cycles. It will be simplified when 
true astrological findings become possible when man knows the hour of his departure from this outer plane and masters the technique of withdrawal and the methods of abstracting himself consciously from the prison of the body. With much research has to take place first. The fact, however, that the problem is recognized and that speculation and investigation are right, indicate that the time has come, karmically and from the angle of human evolutionary development, for a study of the etheric body, of the conditioning rays which govern its manifestation in space, and of astrology which governs its manifestation in time. It is for this reason that the world today is full of groups in revolt against orthodox medicine, wrongly in revolt, because in their fanatical enthusiasm for their particular approach to the problem of healing, they ignore the beneficent aspects of developed medical science. They thus attempt to throw overboard the contribution of the ages to man's knowledge of the human organism, its interrelations and its care, cure and preservation, they fail to profit from past wisdom, but prefer to set sail upon the sea of research in a spirit of revolt, full of prejudice and totally unequipped for the task in hand. Copyright Copyright 1998 Lucis Trust 165 A Treatise on the Seven Rays Volume 4 Esoteric Healing Professors of methods of healing by electricity or light and color, who dietitians with infallible cures for all diseases, the many who practice systems founded on the Abrams mode of diagnosis, and many advocates of the chiropractic methods, as well as the various healing systems which are completely divorced from medicine but which undertake to bring about cures, are all indicative of new and hopeful trends. They are nevertheless extremely experimental in nature, and are so fanatically endorsed, so exclusive of all recognized methods of healing aid except their own, so violently opposed to all the findings of the past, and so unwilling to cooperate with orthodox medicine that, in many cases, they constitute a definite and real danger to the public. It is largely their own faulty approach which is responsible for this, their undoubted ignorance of the nature of the human body, their attack on existent medical practices even of proven value, and their fierce belief in the infallibility of their experimental techniques, have brought them under the attack of the rigidly orthodox medical practitioners and of the fundamentalists within the ring paths not of academic medicine. Within the ranks of medicine are many enlightened men who would gladly cooperate if the small and vociferous cults would relinquish their exclusiveness and be willing to cooperate and accept that which the divine instinct in man down the ages has taught in connection with the healing of the human body. It will be through the collaboration of the new experimental schools and the older and proven methods that the medicine of the future will be developed. The value of all the many groups, good and indifferent, lies in the fact that they point the way towards new trends and indicate the lines along which the medicine of the future can enrich itself and become better adapted to man's need. They are too experimental as yet to be trustworthy, and are not yet scientifically proved. They are pioneering groups, and have a real contribution to make, but this will only be possible if they refuse to divorce themselves from the past and are willing to compromise in the present. Academic medicine is the result of the God-given gifts of the human mind, it is a proven divine expression and a most beneficent force in the world, in spite of human weakness, commercial exploitation and many mistakes. It is the same with religion. Both of these great sciences must eliminate the reactionary and fundamentalist positions, and then proceed with an open mind into the new ways of approach to divinity and of approach to physical well-being.
evening. It might therefore be said that the main contribution which I am making at this time is to indicate the causes of disease and ill health which are not recognized by orthodox medicine, which deals with the effects of these subtle causes as they work out in the physical body and the nervous system. I am not dealing, as I have earlier warned you, with the symptoms of disease, with medical diagnosis or with systems of applied physical means to bring about cures or to ameliorate conditions. These have kept pace with man's growing capacity to discover and to know. Let me reiterate that I am laying the foundation for an approach to the subject of the physical body and health and disease which will deal primarily with the etheric body. This should. Copyright Copyright 1998 Lucis Trust 166 A Treatise on the Seven Rays Volume 4 Esoteric Healing Eventually lead to an accumulation of knowledge and end energy, its focal points and distribution in the etheric body, which will equal that already gained in the field of exact physical knowledge, and that exact knowledge is a fact. The study of inherited disease indicates a faint recognition of man's karmic liabilities and karmic tendencies. A mistake lies however in the belief that these tendencies are to be found in the germs of life and of substance, brought together at the moment of conception, and therefore that the father or the mother is responsible for the transmission. Such is not the case. The subject in incarnation has, from the angle of the soul, definitely and consciously chosen his parents for what they can contribute to this physical makeup whilst in incarnation. The vital body is therefore of such a nature that the man is predisposed to a particular type of infection or of disease. The physical body is of such a nature that its line of least resistance permits of the appearance and control of that which the vital body makes In its creative work and in its vital vehicle, a particular constitution to which the parents chosen contribute a definite tendency. The man is therefore non-resistant to certain types of disease. This is determined by the karma of the man. It is well known to students of the esoteric sciences that the physical body is simply an automaton, responsive to an actuated by a subtler body of energies which are a true expression of the point in evolution. This point in evolution may be that of personality control, through one or other of its bodies, or of soul control. These are facts which the medical profession must grasp, and when it does a great step forward will have been made. Esoteric students are willing to recognize that the physical body is automatic in its response to emotional, mental or soul impression, so closely, however, is the etheric body interwoven with the physical vehicle that it is well nigh impossible to separate the two in consciousness, this will not be proven or possible until the science of etheric energy and the development of clairvoyant perception demonstrate the truth of what I say. This is again a needed repetition. Medical science, through its study of the nervous system and its recognition of the power of thought over the physical body, is moving rapidly in a right direction. When it admits, in relation to the physical body, that energy follows thought, and then begins to experiment with the concept of thought currents, as they are erroneously called, which are directed to certain areas of the etheric body, where the esotericists posit the existence of energy points or centers, much will then be discovered. Oh, man.
otherwise man might have been permanently deluded. Had Christian science fulfilled the original intention of the group of initiates who sought to influence humanity through its agency, and had it developed the idea correctly that energy. Copyright Copyright 1998 Loses Trust 167 The Treatise on the Seven Rays Volume 4 Esoteric Healing Follows Thought Medical Science Would Have Greatly Benefited Its Presentation Was Both Too High and Too Low And A Great Opportunity Was Lost Christian Science Has Failed From The Angle Thank you.
to the ordinary healing group. The higher the centers considered, involved and dealt with, the more potent the results, and therefore the greater care required. The whole process is one of either stimulating activity or withdrawing energy, of making more active an allied center and thus abstracting attention from the center governing the diseased area or organ, or of balancing the energies flowing between two centers and thus producing an equable and even interplay. The more the neophyte studies this subject of healing the more complex it will appear, until the time comes when he can work in collaboration with some physician who has the inner vision and can see the centers, or with patients who know within themselves their own destiny and can collaborate with some group which has sound occult knowledge, which can ascertain the patient's race and which knows at least the nature of his disposition or his indisposition, Vital body of the planet is made. D. 
slightly directed to and through the center and ball. Healing work is circulatory, and this must not be forgotten. The pranic energy, thought directed, is not sent to the center and is permitted to accumulate. It is passed through the center, first of all to the organ involved or the area where difficulty is to be found, and then is sent out to the body as a totality. It might be regarded as a system of flushing, with a purificatory and stimulating effect. It is only possible in these early days of experiment and work along these lines to give certain simple rules. Out of the results achieved experience will come, and the healing group will learn gradually how to work, when to change its methods, and what to notice.